I am going to speak on the discovery of penicillin, one of the great discoveries of the 20th century. Let me give you a brief background of the 20th century, a background against which this discovery was made. There is no doubt that the 20th century produced far more revolutionary changes in the affairs of man than those produced in the previous thousand years. Science and technology were the twin gods at whose altar man worshipped. These gods changed the economy, the social state of man, allowed him to conquer to an extent both time and space, made him produce dangerous forces which are difficult to control. Medicine also changed markedly in the 20th century based on science, wedded to technology, linked to physics, chemistry, biophysics, biochemistry, economics, human anthropology. Medicine made a great advance during the century, but remarkably, remarkably, it was more in the latter half of the century than in the earlier quarter of the century. The earlier quarter of the century was marked by great advances in the natural sciences. Amazingly, great advances in the natural sciences, even in earlier centuries, preceded advances in medicine. You can't forget Einstein, or Max Planck, or Niels Bohr, or Rutherford, who first split the atom and started the work of atomic physics. You can't forget Eisenberg. You can't forget Schrodinger and Fermi, the Italian, Enrico Fermi, a great theoretical and practical physicist who was the first to produce an atomic chain reaction at the University of Colorado. Now, what about medicine at this point in time when the natural sciences were advanced so much? There was nothing from the point of view of therapeutics. Ehrlich and Dogma, working on dyes, found a substance within the dye which could affect bacteria. They made the bacteria bacteriostatic. They did not allow them to multiply didn't kill them. It was a bacteriostatic effect. And the drugs that came out at that point in time, in the earlier part of the 20th century, was sulfenamide and sulfadiazine. They might be effective for ordinary infections like tonsillitis, etc. But when it came to fulminant infections, to sepsis, to conditions like meningitis, they were of no use, patients continued to die. And then came Alexander Fleming. Alexander Fleming was a brilliant student. He wanted to become a surgeon. The First World War broke out and he joined in the British Army Medical Corps where he was a captain. And in the eight, around 18, 1918, 1919, Battle of the Somme was raging at that point in time. He was attending soldiers who were wounded, but much more importantly, he was doing bacteriology on the lungs of patients who died of the Spanish flu. I forgot to mention when I first spoke of the Spanish flu, that it was thought at that point in time that the disease might be due to a bacillus called the Pleifer's bacillus. Pleifer was a great German bacteriologist who found out the Pleifer's bacillus. 
Hemophilus influenza. And he was strongly convinced that the Spanish flu was due to this passage. And the Germans, you know, believed their professors to be demigods and they all said it was due to the plifeless vaccines. But the British and the Americans being a little more doubtful and not that respectful of professors felt that it wasn't so because that organism was found sometimes but not always in the specimens, in the lung specimens of those who have died of Spanish flu. And Alexander Fleming was one of those who felt that it was not due to this bacillus. His chief was a person called Dr. Almuth Wright. He was very famous, really, or became very famous, because he was a discoverer of the typhoid vaccine. Now, Almuth Wright converted a huge, big casino into a lab, into a laboratory, looking out for microorganisms in patients who had died of the Spanish flu. And as an amazing outside, aside, by the way, the, the uh, good biography of Alexander Fleming is by André Marois. And this is how he describes an amusing incident, that one day a French delegation of top-notch medical doctors came into this casino to discuss matters with the British. And to their amazement, they found two people wrestling with each other. They were aghast. These two people saw the French delegation, quietly disengaged themselves, sat down as if nothing had happened, and started discussing bacteriology with the French. An observer was there, was surprised, not surprised, was amazed to see the shock on the face of the French officers at this. The two wrestlers were Alexander Fleming and Arnold Wright. Just as a happy aside. Well, after the war, after the war, Alexander Fleming was extremely fond, had a hobby of rifle shooting. He couldn't get a post in surgery. Therefore, he decided to join St. Mary's Hospital in, as a temporary job in the vaccination department of all things, merely to get into the team. Into the, into the hospital team of rifle shooting. And there he started working and remarkably enough, instead of a surgery, surgery, he became a great microbiologist. The first discovery that he made was the discovering a, a substance called lysozyme from the tears of anyone. This lysozyme, you know, would destroy any bacteria that it came in contact with. And it was a good defense for the body, particularly for any organisms affecting or infecting the eye. And then he started his work on Staphylococci. These are germs, dangerous germs, which classically produce boils or abscesses, but sometimes can produce severe infections that can lead to death. He was growing staphylococci on a petri dish. A petri dish is a dish which is plated by a nutrient material like agar or blood agar on which these organisms can easily grow. So he was growing these staphylococci and studying these staphylococci on these, on these petri dishes. <clears throat> well, it was summer time, so he decided he needed a break, so he took a holiday. When he came back and returned to his laboratory, he found an amazing thing. He found that his petri dish, which had grown staphylococci, was contaminated by a fungus. Now, he noticed a peculiar thing, that wherever the fungus had come or grown, the staphylococci, the organisms, the colony of the staphylococci, was liquidated was absorbed, was destroyed. Where did this fungus come from? That's the question. It could have come from an open window. The suggestion is that there was another scientist on a floor below who was researching on fungi and it might have come up from below and got into Alexander Fleming's lab and settled down on that petri dish. But the thing was that this fungus, the point where these fungus had grown, 
the stuff in the cocaine will destroy me. Anyone would have said, well, this petri dish is contaminated, it's spoiled, throw it away, let's take another one. But no. He said, how is it that this fungus has destroyed the staphylococci? Obviously, the fungus is secreting something which destroys this organism. So he worked on that. He worked on that and he found that the fungus was called penicillin. Penicillium, he gave it a name, penicillium notatum. And then he found that when he, when he, when he, when he, when he tried this uh, penicillin, this fungus, or the secretions of this fungus on other organisms, like the streptococcus, the pneumococcus, the gonococcus, etc., those two were destroyed. So this was an important substance. So what else did he do? He studied the effects of penicillin and found that it didn't affect the white blood cells. It didn't affect tissue cells as well. And that is it. He wrote this up. He wrote this up in a journal and the journal was in some archive in all the libraries that were there. That is it. What he failed to do, surprisingly enough, was not to try the effect of penicillin on organisms infecting an animal. For example, he didn't infect an animal with one of the staphylococci and then seeing if penicillin would cure that. He didn't do that. One wonders why he didn't do that. Pasteur, for example, Robert Koch, for example, would have certainly done that. Why did he not do that? Perhaps the answer is that he found that when penicillin was mixed in blood, with blood, in a syringe or in a test tube, it lost its efficacy. But then what happens in a test tube or in a syringe does not necessarily happen in the human body. So this is one thing that he failed to do, but he made this discovery and he wrote it up. Well, now sometime in 1935 or so, there was a person, a doctor called Dr. Flory. He was a brilliant pathologist. And at the age, young age of 35, he was the head of the pathology department in Oxford University. He hired a biochemist by name of Dr. Chain. And they decided to look up all the literature of the past 30 years to see if they could find any chemical substance which could destroy bacteria. Bactericide. Bacteriostatic prevents bacteria from multiplying. Not has been found. Bactericidal, which destroys bacteria. They searched 250 citations, 250 papers, and at last came across the paper by Alexander And he said, oh, look, this is one paper where he writes that penicillin, penicillium, the fungus, destroyed the staphylococcus. So let's work on that. So they started working on penicillin. They got the fungus. They found out what it was secreting. But it was impossible for all practical purposes to get the active substance secreted by this fungus. To get a purified part of that substance, one purified portion out of 2,000 or so portions, which is extremely difficult to get a proper substance. But they were at it. They were absolutely at it. By that time, the war was about to break over. Both of them suddenly realized that, my God, if you found a bactericidal substance against these organisms, because it was not just the Staphylococcus, he had found it, Fleming had found it active against a large number of other organisms, it would be a great boom. So they decided, tried their best to purify the substance, which was very difficult to purify in its purified form. And they found, remarkably enough, that the best way to extract the substance, the vital substance from this fungus, was in bed patterns. 
So the whole of the pathology department of Oxford University was one of bedpans. All over there were bedpans trying to purify this single substance from this process. It was very difficult. At last they managed to find or get a small amount of substance and they decided let's try it on a human being. And they tried it on a policeman. This, this poor man, policeman, was pruning his garden and was pricked by a thorn of a rose. And that became infected. And it was a staphylococcal infection. And that infection, mind you, from a small pustule on the skin spread to his body and he became extremely illegal, extremely sick. So they gave him the drug. They injected that drug, penicillin, they called it penicillin, on the first day. And he thought, they thought he was a little better, but they had not much penicillin. They injected him again on the third day, took off, well, extracted whatever penicillin that he had excreted in his urine, got that and gave it to him on his third day, and he was much better. But then there was no penicillin after that. And the man died. But they were sure that this was something important. And... Uh, Flory was quite certain that they did not have the means to produce enough penicillin to even do a decent clinical trial on human beings. Therefore, they did a very wise thing. They also had by that time another person called Heatley, also a very good biochemist, who had helped them in fact to increase the product or the produce of penicillin to a point where they could use it on this place. So Flory and Chen decided to go to the United States. And there they teamed up with somebody, I forget in which, in which laboratory, I think it was in Illinois, with a doctor called Dr. Moini or so. And he turned out to be a rather peculiar person. In the sense, he took all the information from the British, whatever they had done, whatever procedures they had done, but wouldn't say anything about what he was doing. But the American government realized that there was much in this. I forgot to tell you that when these boys went to the British government and said, okay, look, we've got something which might turn out to be very valuable for the war. By this time, bombs are falling on London. Might be very valuable for the war. The British government said, I'm sorry, we just don't have the money or we don't have the time to engage in uh, producing this, manufacturing this on the scale. But the Americans caught on to it. And they said, yes, and the whole government effort was spent on producing this penicillin. Penicillin was tried then on some men, and women, I think they made its superb effect. And by the time of D-Day, the landing in Normandy, penicillin was produced in sufficient quantities, sufficient quantities to take care of the wounds of soldiers landing in Normandy. And a large number of lives were saved by this. And it's amazing that the Germans didn't know anything about it. The Italians never knew anything about it. It was something which only the Allies had. And they say it was one factor which helped the Allies win the war. Now, whilst all this hoo-ha was going on before all this, mind you, before D-Day, before everything, poor Fleming... Uh, was seeing what was happening in Oxford, was noting what was happening in Oxford. And one day, appealed for some penicillin to be used for a friend of his who had suffered from a severe infection. And the man lived. So he wrote and said, I'm very grateful to you for giving me this penicillin. The man lived. It was dead that Dr. Almuth Wright Remember what I said? He was his stop. He was his superior. Wrote a letter in the Times that please note that this penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming. What I admire most about this man, when he knew all this was happening, he never came out and said, "Look, I discovered penicillin. All you chaps, what are you doing? Whatever you, whatever you are doing, but remember, I discovered penicillin." He never said a word. It was Albert Wright who, writing a letter in the Times of India, Times of London, 
who said that, please remember that this penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming. And then, of course, the doors of fame opened. This is the discovery of penicillin. There's some nice things that he had to say. When he said, for example, the unprepared mind will not meet the outstretched hand of a portrait. And some nice things also that he said. One sometimes finds things one is not looking out for. He was lo not looking out for penicillin, mind you. And then he says, it was an accident. The discovery of penicillin was an accident, but a fortunate one. It happened whilst I was engaged in the study of other academic problems. So he was a very humble man also. The Nobel Prize was given to Alexander Fleming, to Florey of the Oxford Department, and to Chain. But to Norman Hickley, the man who sort of increased the output of penicillin, so that it could be tried at least on some individuals. He was ignored completely. It was only after a long time that they realized the value of the work that Norman Hickley had been done, and he was awarded a doctorate, a honorary doctorate of medicine by the University of Oxford. It's amazing that after this discovery, a plethora of discoveries, were seen in medicine. A lot of work was done on fungi to see if other antibiotics could be derived from the fungi. And Robert Baxman, for example, discovered streptomycin from a fungus called streptomycin griseus. Then there was work on anti-TB drugs, para-aminosalicylic acid, isoniazid. And then a plethora of drugs came onto the scene. It became a pill-popping society. But the question is, the point is, that the discovery of penicillin started the discovery of numerous other medical substances. I think Alexander Fleming was a great man. Why? Any other individual would have probably thrown away the petri dish and saying it's contaminated with fungi and let be. But he didn't let be. He saw that there was something funny about this. He pursued this. And in this pursuit, he made a great discovery. Penicillin still remains a great, great antibiotic used against numerous infections. And remember, it's amazing. He also said that if you use penicillin indiscriminately, believe me, it's quite likely that the bugs would get resistant to it. So he warned of this as well. I think that's about all the 